uh, I'm looking forward to sharing the, this new series with you. It's, it's called Gideon, and the whole theme is called The Truth About Faith. So the first message is the actual theme of this whole series of eight messages. If you actually want to get the book, you can go up the back even right now and get the whole book. If you want just today's notes, you can do that. But I pray it'll be a blessing with you. I'm excited to share this series with you, and this is the first week on that. This series is, of course, is about Gideon in the book of Judges, chapter 6, 7, 8. <coughs> it's a great story of Gideon. But I have this down in eight messages, and it's the truth about faith. So the whole theme of Gideon is not just about faith, but what I call the truth about faith. Everybody here would say they have faith. Yet to be frank with you, I would question if you really know what faith is. The longer that I live, the more I realize this. Christians are divided into two camps. Those who live victoriously and those who live defeated lives. I see Christians are divided into two camps. Those who live victoriously and those who live defeated lives. There are Christians here right now. You're walking victoriously. And there are more Christians right now who are living defeated lives. Now, you might have high moments or low moments, but if your Christian walk is high and low, that is not victorious. So if you say, today I'm high, last week I was low, next week could be high, next week is low, that does not mean you're living a victorious Christian life. You're living a defeated life because a victorious Christian life is not about highs, lows, highs, lows, highs, lows. It's about a consistency. The Apostle John gives us, I believe, the secret of what it is to live victorious Christian lives. And the secret is really simple. Keep it simple, saints. Kiss. Okay? It's really simple. 1 John, or 1 John 5, 4, listen to what is written. Because whatever has been born of God conquers, that means overcomes, because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. Let me repeat this first part. For whatever has been born again, okay, conquers the world. We don't have that word to go on the screen there, okay? But because whatever has been born again conquers the world, this is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. Everyone say our faith. Our faith. Our faith. This is what John says conquers the world, our faith. It doesn't say the prayers of your pastor. It doesn't say the salvation of your spouse. It doesn't say your income. It doesn't say your health. It says here, this is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. It's not the faith of Jesus. He's already conquered death. It's our faith. It's not the faith of mom and dad. It's your individual faith. That's the secret in the verse. The secret to victory is an absolute trust in God. It's an unswerving obedience to his commands. People say they have faith, but they don't obey. If you're not obedient, you don't have faith. Because having faith makes you obey. If you're rebellious and you even joke about being rebellious, then I'd say to you, you don't have faith. We make a joke today about being a rebel. We make a joke today about being rebellious. The Bible warns us in Isaiah, there will come a day when we call that which is wrong right and that which is right wrong. And today, we make rebellion to be cute and right. But the Bible says it's still wrong, even though the culture of our day has changed it. Absolute trust in God, unswerving obedience to his commands. Faith is your victory. Faith is my victory. Faith is my wife's victory. Faith is my mother's victory. Faith is our son and daughter-in-law's victory. By faith, we give our lives to God. By faith, we surrender control of our lives to him. We do this not to impress God, we don't do this to buy his favor. We're not under an old covenant. But we do this as an expression of gratitude to God for the salvation that he freely gives us through Jesus Christ. We have to remember that there is faith and then there is faith. We have to remember that there is faith and there is faith. Pastor, you saying the same thing. No. There is faith 
and there is faith. Much of what we call faith is not authentic faith. It's not true faith. You know, it's possible to be very religious. It's possible to engage in religious activities. It's possible to impress other people with the intensity of our religion and yet be completely devoid of what I call authentic faith. We can offer sacrifices like Cain. We can weep like Esau. We can serve like Gehazi to Elijah. We can flee Sodom like Lot's wife. We can minister like Korah the Levite, the cousin of Moses who undermined his leadership. We can prophesy like King Saul did in the beginning of his ministry. We can make long prayers like the Pharisees. We can even be a disciple like Judas. We can be a seeker of truth like the rich young ruler. We can even tremble like Felix, the Roman authority in Acts 24, who kept calling Paul out to ask questions about God. We can be like all of these and still be without faith. All of these people had some form of deep religious understanding, but none of them had faith. Not the genuine, authentic, absolute faith. There is nothing more futile in this world as being religious, yet at the same time being lost. Maintaining a form of religion, but lacking in faith. In Jesus' day, it wasn't the lost and the sinners that caused them the problems. It was the religious of the day. Today, the more religious you become, the more harder it is to sow seed. The more harder it is to be at church, let alone twice on a Sunday. The more harder it is to be at a conference. The more harder, because there's always other things, because we're so caught up in religion that we think we have faith, but I tell you, it is not authentic faith. Let me tell you this first of all, and allow me to explain it, because sometimes this statement causes a reaction. There is no power whatsoever in our faith. <gasps> you let me explain it. There is no power whatsoever in your faith. I have faith. There's no power in your faith. The power comes from the object of our faith, not from faith itself. The power is not in your faith. Well, I have faith to believe that I'll get that money. Well, I have faith to believe that I'll be healed. Well, I have faith to believe. There is no power in your faith. The power is in the object of our faith. If you say, well, I have faith that I can fly. Anybody ever do that as a kid? You know, I have to admit I did that one time. Luckily, it wasn't too high, okay? I thought the cape, which was the towel, okay, would empower me to fly, okay? Black and white Superman shows did not do good, okay? And then I thought I could be like Tarzan and actually grab, and they snapped. Okay, but anyhow, you can tell me, and I'm taking extreme measure here, but it relates. You can tell me that you have faith that you can fly, and you can say, I can fly, I can fly, I can fly. Like that donkey on Shrek, wasn't it? I can fly, Okay. And you launch yourself from the top of a 20-story building. I'm going to guarantee you that you will be severely disappointed, if not broken. Because your faith is not in God, the object. Your faith is in somehow your confession or your ability or your psyche. But if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his power, then you will live a victorious Christian life and that kind of faith can move mountains because it's focused on Jesus who is the source of all power. Your faith is not the power. It's in whom you have your faith in that has the power. People have their faith in their spouse and get disappointed. They have faith in their children and get disappointed. They have faith in their parents and get disappointed. They have faith in their pastor and get disappointed. They have faith in their church and get disappointed. They have faith in their governments and get disappointed. God's told you to put your faith in him. Not your spouse. Not your parents. 
not your children, not your work, not your finances. Well, I just believe that they will be good. Well, I just believe your faith's in the wrong place. God says you put your faith in him. Number two, I only have two because I think that's hit enough. Faith has nothing to do with feelings. Authentic faith in Christ does not rise and fall with the emotions. I said to someone, I don't know if it's Sandra or someone else, I've never seen so many emotional people. One day, you're going to take the world. Next day, you're defeated and quit and give up. What that tells me is you lack faith. Real, authentic faith. Faith is a decision to act consistently with the promises of God. We can act in faith even when we're down in the dumps emotionally. We may not feel like we're bubbling over with faith, yet we can still say, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And so many times I find that when we act in accordance with our faith, our feelings will come into line. Do you read Psalm 42? David says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Which is meaning, soul means his emotions. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why are you so discouraged, O my soul? Read Psalm 42. Psalm 42 is David is talking to himself. You know, it's biblically okay to talk to yourself. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. This is the great news now is that when I'm in the car, this is before, because of mobile phones and you can talk hands-free, when I am at the lights and I'm talking to myself, I go, dude, why aren't you doing that? Dude, why are you going to hear? Then someone's looking at me and I go, phone. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's okay. You know what I mean? Phone. It's, it's a real blessing. You know, in the early days, they thought, woo-hoo. You know what I mean? But anyhow, it works out great. You know what I mean? <clears throat> I'm in the car park, parked up there. And I can be in the car for 10 minutes talking. And people go, Phone? I go, yeah, phone. But sometimes I'm just talking to myself, okay? But the fact is, it works good, you know? But faith is a decision to act consistently with God's promises. I have found that when you do press through, that so many times your feelings come into line. They fall in behind. They get behind you. In the book of Judges chapter 7, we can see the emergence or the budding faith of Gideon. In Judges 6, the chapter before, we see that when God called Gideon, he was doubtful, he was distrustful, and he was insecure. When God first calls him, he doubts it. You got the wrong guy. I'm the weakest of the weakest of the weakest. He's distrustful. Are you really meant to come here and talk to me? And he's insecure. I don't think I can do the job. He could not bring himself to believe that God could do what he said he wanted to do in this man's life. But in Judges 7, there's a chapter over, we see Gideon's faith beginning to bud like a flower in springtime. And very soon we would see that it would open into a full bloom. And we'll do this through this series. Gideon would learn what it is to trust God. He would learn what it is to take God fully at his word, and he'd learn what it is to act boldly on the belief that God will do what he says he will do. <laughs> In Judges chapter 7, verse 1 to 3, Jeroboam, that is Gideon. Now, Jeroboam, or Yeroboam as a Y, Yeroboam, okay, as it should be in Hebrew. Yeroboam is the name that his father gave him. No, not one who's born, but when God said to Gideon, pull down all of the statues to Baal. He goes, God, I'm too scared. Can I do it at night while everybody sleeps? So the Lord said, okay, do it at night. So while everybody was sleeping, he went around the town and pulled down all the false idols and destroyed them. When they woke up in the morning, all the town came and said, who pulled down the idols to Baal? And somehow they got to Gideon's dad and said, do you realize the curse on us? Do you realize what the enemy will do? Do you realize 
what the gods of Baal will do now that your son in the night hours pulled down these idols. And the father said, I've changed his name. His name's not Gideon, but Yerubal, meaning let Baal contend with him. Meaning don't bring the curse on us, his people or his family, but I now call you a Jeroboam, Jeroboam, let Baal contend with you to get revenge, not on us. That's the sort of home that Gideon grew up in. The weakest of the weakest of the weakest. You may feel that you are in an environment or a home where faith is not exercised. You may feel that because you're in an environment where faith is not exercised, that you therefore are excused. But not in my Bible. Not in my Bible. Jeroboam, Gideon, and everyone who was with him got up early and camped, behind, camped beside the spring of Harad. The camp of the Midian was north of them, below the hill of Morah in the valley. I'm moving forward from chapter 6, because this is my introduction to the series. And Gideon has men of 32,000. That sounds pretty impressive, 32,000, until you realize your enemy has 135,000. It's easy enough to think right now that Gideon is already moving in faith. And not only is he moving in faith, but he has somehow influenced another 32,000 men to have the same faith and follow him. But still, 32,000 against 130-something thousand isn't really that big. Verse 2, and the Lord speaks to Gideon. He doesn't call him Jeroboam as his father does. He speaks to him as Gideon. And the Lord speaks to Gideon. He says, you have too many people for me to hand the Midianites over to you. <laughs> Are you serious? Do you know how long it's taken to get these guys here? Or else Israel might brag, I did it myself. See, that's always the problem in ministry. You know, we need a financial breakthrough or we need our marriage restored or we need a healing. And we're at church, ah, help me, oh God, help me. Oh, I'm fasting. Oh, I'm at the prayer meeting. Oh, I'll serve you, God. Oh, if I'm not working, I'll come and paint the church. Oh, I'll serve God. Oh. And the miracle happens. Breakthrough in business, marriage restored, kid comes back, buddy healed. I testify that even though the day was dark, I had faith. I had faith. Even when the storm tempest built up around me, I had faith. Come all the way around again. It's coming. It's coming back. What you thought you were delivered from, I've seen it coming back. Because he says, I don't share my glory. Well, I don't really know why I need to give because really it's my own brilliance that brought the money in. <laughs> Whew. That's why there ain't too many wealthy ones. You have too many people for me to hand the Midianites over to you, or else Israel might brag, I did it myself. Verse 3. Now announce in the presence of the people, whoever is, fe they, <laughs> whoever is fearful. You know what I mean? Wouldn't it be better to say whoever is brave? You know what I mean? It's 32,000 against 130 something. It's like Joshua. Lord, if they ridicule us, we'll know it's your sign to attack them. Well, of course they're going to ridicule you. They outnumber you. You know what I'm trying to say? Duh. You know what you say? Now announce in the presence of the people, whoever is fearful and trembling may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 of the people turn back, but 10,000 remain. That is discouraging. That is not a ministry encouragement moment. God is about to turn the tables on Gideon. In Judges 6, Gideon kept saying to God, show me, show me, show me. Let the fleece be dry on the ground wet and the ground wet and the fleece dry. Show me, show me, show me. And God graciously, patiently, 
proved himself to Gideon again and again and again. Even he went to the enemy's camp and heard them talk about a dream. They heard of Gideon as a bread rolling down. and, and break. Who could think bread could cause such damage? But anyhow, the fact of the matter is, it was all there. And Gideon proved himself through the supernatural flame of sacrifice and through the two fleeces Gideon laid out. And every time Gideon said, show me, and God gave him proof. So Gideon has come to this point where he's trusting in the promise of God. And now it's God's turn to say, show me. Gideon has been saying to God in Judges 6, show me, Lord, show me, Lord, show me, Lord, show me, Lord. And now when Gideon finally has faith, God turns the tables. And in Judges 7, God says, Gideon, yeah, show me. Doesn't it go the other way? It isn't show me meant to be when I, I, the human being, say to the big fella up, up high, Show me your real, give me a sign. But now when I finally get faith, God, you're now saying to me, the human being, show me. That's not in my book. Show me. You're meant to show me, to encourage me. But now, God, when I do have faith and I got 32,000 guys together, you're saying, show me, Gideon, that you have faith because I'm going to take away two-thirds of your men. And God's saying, show me. And God graciously, patiently proved himself to Gideon again and again. He proved himself through the supernatural flame of sacrifice, through the two fleeces Gideon laid out. And every time Gideon said, show me, show me, show me, Gideon's come to trust in God. And now God's saying, show me. God's saying, it's your turn, Gideon, to show me. I want you to show me that your faith is not real. Do you trust me, Gideon? Then show me. I have brought down the men from 32,000 to 10,000. Show me. Show me that you have faith. Show me. The enemy forces are encamped in the valley to the north of them. In Judges 8, it tells us there's like 135,000 men, so the odds are already tilted steeply against Israel. Gideon is probably already battling fear, okay, if he has the ability to deal with 135,000 army when he's only got 32. Then God tells Gideon, you have too many soldiers for me to be glorified. I mean, he has to be thunderstruck, doesn't he? I mean, I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us too much, but I, I, I'm sure Gideon had doubt. I'm sure Gideon might have even had a little dummy spit saying, Lord, you can't be serious. How can I have too many soldiers? The enemy already outnumber us more than four to one. How can you ask me to downsize my army even further? But God moves in excellent reason beyond our understanding as he reduces the size of Gideon's army. If you defeat the Midianites, 135,000, with an army of 32,000 men, the people of Israel will boast and say that we saved ourselves, we don't need God. So I want you to trim your army down and tell your soldiers that whoever is afraid, whoever lacks faith, go home. What we found out is more than two-thirds of Gideon's soldiers were cowards. More than two-thirds of Gideon's soldiers didn't have authentic faith. Now, they had faith because if they didn't have faith, they wouldn't have gone out there with Gideon in the first place, Correct? They had a level of faith because they believed what he said and they followed him. They had faith. But when the invitation was given to run, when the invitation was given to go, when the invitation was given to look after yourself, two-thirds took it. They ran. The Israelites were overmatched by a factor of 13 and a half to one. By any rational measure, the Israelites did not stand a chance. But the odds are about to get worse. And we're going to read about that in the future studies. Can you take this for me, Kevin? 
this is my introduction. The truth about faith. The truth about faith. This is the opening message on the life of Gideon. Seven more to go. But the moral of this message, the story, the truth in this message is, I know you have faith, but do you have authentic faith? Now, the first thing you might feel is a level of condemnation. That's not me. That's you doing that. This message is not condemnation. This message is conviction. If you feel condemnation, it's not the preacher condemning you. It's you entertaining it. Because condemnation says there's no way out, you're finished. Conviction says there's a way out. And this message is a way out. It's telling you you need to come back into an authentic relationship with Jesus. You need to stop giving in to your feelings. You need to stop quitting. You need to stop being inconsistent. You need to be reliable. You need to be dependable. You need to stop saying stupid things that are more important than being in fellowship with him in God's house and honoring him. Why? Because the true sign of authentic faith is obedience to the word. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, you'll have goosebumps. He said, if you love me, you'll obey me. But you won't obey him because he's going to judge you or cast you out. That's old covenant. You're not in the old covenant. Once you become born again, you're born again. He's not going to damn you. He's not going to curse you. He's not going to reject you. But your behavior will have consequences. Not only on you, but on your children, on your marriage, in relationships. It continues. What you refuse to break through on, you give as a gift to your children. What you refuse to conquer, you say to your children, he's a gift from me. Jeremiah says, our children gnash upon gnash of their teeth the sour grapes of their fathers. Pastor, I just don't think that your teaching is new covenant. Because in the new covenant, we don't preach like that. Well, maybe if you read your Bible a little more, you would have read Acts 20. Acts 20 Apostle Paul, as he's saying farewell, he's going to Jerusalem. The next chapter, Agabus is going to tell him he's going to be taken and killed. He's saying, you'll never see me again. I'm about to go. My life is over on this earth. I'm going to be of the Lord, but don't be fearful. Rejoice with me. He said this, the one thing I know is that I have not defrauded you. I have not stolen from you. I have not taken from you. And your blood is not on my hands. Now, everybody thinks that such a doctrine saying your blood's on my hand is old covenant. But Paul brings it up in Acts 20. You can read it. He said, because I will go, and he is saying, I'll meet my death, and I'll be called up to God. And whether you serve God or don't serve God, because I've spoken the truth, your blood will not be on my hands because I told you. What you do with it, it's up to you, but I told you, that's new covenant teaching. Well, pastor, where's grace? There. It's called the cross. The grace is he loves you. You can't earn it. See, there was a sister uh, who I love doesn't, she, in another part of the world, not in Australia, and struck with sickness. Very sad, struck with sickness. Beautiful young lady, struck with sickness. Not in Australia, another part of the world. And I know this person personally. My wife was ministering to this person. <clears throat> and the pastor was going through his own battle. 
And in the midst of her sickness, the pastor was not there for her. So she left church. She might come back to church. Why? This pastor's not there for me. I've gone through hell, still going for hell. Pastor, I left church. So she rang up another one of that pastor's friends at another church out of town. I began to tell her. See, this is what happens. When disappointment comes in, evil lurks. Because see, what's happening is called gossip. I already said to my wife, now I rang up another pastor. I guarantee you a lot. Gossiping, gossiping, gossiping. Because where disappointment comes, when disappointment is not dealt with, gossip and murmuring comes in. So you can be a victim, but come under a curse. All the curses are broken. So you have to open the door for it. This pastor nailed her. Boom! He says, God gives you a choice. Both words start with V. You're either a victor or a victim. You, my dear, are a victim. Until you become a victor, there is no hope. Bam! I contacted my wife again. He said, I just got a slap down, but it was good. Because in my pain, which was gossiping, you know what happens when you entertain it and don't rebuke it? You're a gossip too. And in that pain, in that disappointment, evil lurked. You might feel disappointed. If you don't get the victory, rather than be a victim, evil hovers around you. She comes from here. She comes from here. She woke up. She said, instead of me being a victor, I became a victim. What was it? No faith. Well, they had faith, not authentic faith. They had faith in their pastor. They had faith in their own prayers. They had faith in the prayers of others. They had faith in pastor visiting them. They had faith in something else. But they didn't have authentic faith. Because faith, my friends, won't get you to victory. Faith in God gets you to victory. And if you have faith in God, you are never a victim. Never a victim. Never a victim. You're only a victor. And when people tell you, I'm walking in faith, and what's coming out is not, they're not walking in faith. They're walking in faith in something else, but not faith in him. My call to you, can you come up, Lisa, for me? I should have called you up before. My call to you, I'm down here now, Colin, okay? So I was up there, I've changed it, so it'd see me better, but it's all right. Good, right. See me? All right, good. So the fact is, sometimes I'm too hard to see up there. So the key is this. Friends, I appeal to you, walk in faith. Now, the pastor is here to encourage you, of course, but they're human. For every time you think your pastor lets you down, think of how many times you let your pastor down. It's two or three. Every time you think your spouse lets you down, think how many times you let your spouse down. And every time you think your parents let you down, think out how many times you let your parents down. And so it goes on. We've got to get rid of the victim and become the victor. And when you decide to obey, even though it hurts, and even though there's tears, you are commanding your feelings to no longer be in front, but to move around you, fall behind. Be in line. Yeah. Be in line. Feelings, I'm walking in faith. So I'm commanding you in the name of Jesus to fall in line. Get behind me. Get behind me. Get behind me. Get behind me. And as you're walking in authentic faith because you're obeying, those feelings, like a muscle, will respond and say, I submit. It's like an injury and you go to that physio. It will eventually yield because of the manipulation, the work. It will eventually yield and give way. And all of a sudden you go like, oh, my shoulder's loose. My eyesight's better. 
I breathe better. I can stand on my toes. I can hug Bill. <laughs> you can always hug Bill. I'm just teasing you there. I just thought you'd love a hug there. Did you like that hug? That's good. Yeah. Don't leave me hanging. Don't leave me hanging. Okay, good. Okay. You get what I'm trying to say? Because feelings, I mean, I, I met with someone this last week and this, someone's dear to me, but I felt hurt. And it took me a long time, but I kept saying, I'm going to walk in faith in God. I'm going to walk in faith. And my feelings are like, guard yourself, guard yourself, protect yourself, and walk in faith. You know, but this week, I had the best victory I ever had with that person. I'm hoping that person has too. I don't, I don't know, okay? But I can only speak about myself. I'm not saying this person hasn't. But it was like this. The feelings that were here moved, moved, and came behind. That's where they belong. Now, I don't want to be insensitive. And I don't want to be a person who has no feelings. But I want them in their right place. And if they're here, there's no faith. But they're here, faith leads.